Welcome back to the Think Bigger Real Estate Show. I'm your host, Justin Stoddart. Thrilled today to talk about leadership. Sales is leadership. Uh, anything that we do in life in which we have impact, in which we grow anything, requires leadership. The challenge is many of us struggle with being a great leader. Today, we're going to talk all about that. Before we get into introducing today's guest and the rest of today's topic, I want to remind you that you can get a show summary, a weekly summary of every show that happens with show notes by going to thinkbigger.realestate. Go sign up for that. Um, I've got it looking really, really good. You're going to be really proud of what you see. You're going to be proud of me for what you see. Um, and the other thing that I want to point out is that if you're watching this in another market and you're interested in finding either a great loan officer and or a great real estate agent, I would encourage you to reach out to me, private message me, send me a message. Um, I work with the best of the best. I'd be more than happy to make a recommendation. Um, with that, let me introduce today's guest. His name is Chad Krober. Um, Chad, first and foremost, thank you for coming on the show today. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Justin. It's good to be here. Thank you. Great to have you here. So Chad, um, Chad's brand is the Purpose Driven Lender, and we're going to talk about that. In fact, today's show is going to is going to be a representation of of, of Chad being that. Um, Chad actually leads a team of ten originators and support staff out of uh, the Portland market. Um, he has been he and his team have been uh, for the past three years in the retail lending space, a top two hundred and fifty uh, producing team in the country. So um, Chad knows a thing or two about leadership. He knows it thing or two about being a top producer. And uh, for those of you that aren't able to stay around for the whole episode, I want you to park on your date, October 25th. It's a Friday from 8.30 to 4.30. There's going to be a very special event happening here in Portland uh, that is going to be free to you, but it's going to be life-changing when it comes to being a great leader. So stay mm -hmm. tuned for that. If you, if you don't make it all the way to the end, um, re look in the show notes and you'll see more information about that. So um, again, thank you for being here, here Chad. Um, I'm going to ask I'm going to start with this question because I believe that the most important leadership that we'll ever do starts off in the home. So I'm going to ask you a question mm -hmm. you probably aren't prepared for, but a guy like you are always is, is always prepared for this kind of question. What's right. your what's what's your favorite part about being a dad, Chad? <laughs> you know, honestly, uh, I think the favorite part of being a dad is having the opportunity to honestly learn from my mistakes and then model that to my kids and show them that I am learning how to become the best version of myself. Even when I uh, trip over myself, I don't handle the situation well, I can model to my kids and say, hey, you know what, dad, I, I did not do this thing well, or I did not handle this situation well, or I did not model this behavior to you well, but I'm working on it. And I need to tell you I'm sorry, and I need to ask for your forgiveness. And it, it's amazing to me how my kids are so quick to say, it's okay, Dad. I know you're doing, you're, you're trying to work, you're trying to grow. I know you're trying to get better. Um, our kids just want to love us more than anything. And that's honestly probably the one of the most enjoyable parts of being a, a parent is being able to learn from my own errors and then model and teach that to my kids. Powerful concepts, Chad. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Uh, for those that are maybe new to the show, uh, this is about thinking bigger than real estate, right? We're fortunate to be involved mm -hmm. in a great industry from different angles, um, yet uh, this becomes a platform. Chad, you and I talked about that before the show, mm -hmm. about yeah. how for you, it's really not about mortgages anymore. Maybe it never mm -hmm. was, but this whole concept of being a purpose-driven lender. Talk to me a little bit about kind of as a prelude into today's topic, yeah. um, like what matters uh, more to you than originating loans? Yeah. You know, I, I'll admit probably up till about maybe five, six years ago, uh, I was way hung up. I was hung up way more on the deal. I was, I was focused on how do I close more loans? How do I uh, increase my wallet? How do I increase my bank account? And I went through a few life situations that caused me to have to re-examine and look in the mirror and say, why am I doing what I'm doing? Um, you know, it. you can jokingly say, yeah, I'm 44 years old. Was it a midlife crisis? Um, maybe not, but just the timing of everything played out in my late 30s, early 40s. And I sat back one day and said, you know what? If, if I'm gone tomorrow and I'm no longer writing loans, will the world even know that I existed? And I had to look in the mirror and say, no, nah, probably not. Because another great loan officer will come along and replace me the day that I decide to hang it up and stop 
doing loans. And so I realized that I needed to change my attitude to say, okay, I get the opportunity to interact with dozens and dozens and dozens and hundreds of people over a year's time. What if I used my platform instead to say, how can I make a difference in someone's life? Instead of just writing alone, how can I bless them? How can I encourage them? How can I model to them uh, things that will make them walk away from our conversation and say, there's something different about that person. And I want to be, I want to become a better version of myself. Um, and so it just took me down this path of saying, all right, mortgages are a tool and, um, mortgages are a way to pay my bills. But ultimately my attitude needs to be, I'm here to serve people. And I think it comes back to the whole idea of servant leadership. We are here to serve others. And I think you actually just had a, a guest here recently who was talking about that, uh, who, who leads a team. Was, and, yeah. and that, you just know, yesterday. yeah, yeah. Just yesterday, Air Cash, right. OK, I, I caught that. I caught that briefly. I didn't get to watch the whole thing, but I caught a snippet of it. And I went, hey, that guy's nailing it. He I think the <laughs> quote that I saw was like, um, nobody works for me. I work for them. I mean, that's the whole concept of being a servant leader is you want to serve those around you and when you come in with an attitude of humbleness and of saying you know what you all can teach me because i really don't really know much honestly but i'm going to do my best to help all of us uh, i'm going to help our tribe get to the finish line in whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish then all of a sudden you have a heart attitude where you can begin to grow and you can be you can expand your boundaries and begin to um, really i think leave an impact on people's lives yeah, I love it, Chad. It was interesting. I'm actually reading the book by Ray Dalio called Principles. Um, you know, probably one of the greatest um, hedge fund managers of all time. Mm. And one of his key principles is is actually humility. Um, mm. you know, a guy mm -hmm. who has every reason to not be humble realized mm -hmm. that that he began to accelerate his own success and impact in the world when he stopped thinking that he knew everything and started to look around to realize like. I can learn from everybody here um, and create a, what he called a meritocracy, which was um, the best ideas win. Doesn't matter if he's the, you know, the founder of the company, Bridgewater, um, that, that isn't what matters. It's who, who has the best ideas, that's what wins. And I think it takes a lot of humility mm -hmm. to be a leader and say, hey, your idea is better than mine, let's do yours. Yep, I, would, I could not agree more. Um, I've even noticed in my emails that I write, I seem to ask a lot more questions help me understand this, or I don't quite understand where you're coming from, or can you uh, help me find out the answer? Because I don't know the answer, yeah. <laughs> to be frankly honest. And you know, the sign of a great leader is recognizing that when you ultimately realize you can't control anything around you, and then you find great people to come alongside you who, do, who actually do things better than you do, uh, then all of a sudden, uh, everything seems to go a lot better uh, for the most part when you when you're moving in the same direction you've got the right people on the bus um, yeah humility is where it's at for sure so we have um, a short amount of time let's say um, five to ten minutes to go through this yeah. concept of rare leadership and, I, yep. and this is going to be what's going to be taught at the event on October 24th um, 25th. And 25th 25th thank you yep. 25th yep. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be um, a really powerful event. Again, some of you may yes. be watching this after October 25th. So, so if that's the case, uh, there's a book called Rare Leadership. But at this event, Dr. Warner, um, who wrote the book, is going to be going through in depth how to apply these principles. And I know um, you and I see it, Chad, where, where um, we have either seen or even ourselves had mm -hmm. experiences where our team grows and then our team shrinks because mm -hmm. we weren't and oftentimes and, and I believe that everything rises or falls on leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think if we want to continue to impact lives and scale a business and serve more people, we mm -hmm. have to get better at leadership. It's not always the people leaving. It's not always their fault. Oftentimes the common, denom the common denominator is us. And so I want to start off by going through this acronym of RARE. And uh, yeah. I'll put it up here on the screen for everybody to see. And then if you'll just give a couple key points Chad, as far as sure. what people can expect to hear about this particular topic. So let's start with number one, remain relational. Yeah, so remain relational, the first uh, letter in that acronym of RARE. The whole idea is, is that uh, the, the typical component of we as humans is when something 
that we don't expect comes at us uh, or something that creates stress or an emotional, uh, you know, our tendency is we want to fight or we want or fight or flight, you know. And so when something hard comes at us or something creates stress or an emotional response, uh, the first dynamic of taking ourselves down this path of saying, you know, leadership demands emotional maturity is I've got to recognize I have to remain relational. I've got to remain calm. I've got to remain in a position where my tribe around me goes, uh-oh, how's the boss going to react to this? And if I remain relational, the first thing I'm doing is I'm setting the tone. I'm setting the atmosphere to say, all right. We've had a big issue come up. We're gonna we're gonna handle this, and we're gonna remain relational, and we're gonna do this together. So it sounds like th that the relationship always matters more than whatever the issue is. Like whatever Absolutely. the situation, the fact that you're a human, and I'm gonna treat you like a human, even if you totally Correct. screwed up. If Correct. I blow you up, guess what? You're not gonna be around for very long. And maybe you were That's a talented right. person, just made a mistake. What I hear you saying is that you always treat that person like you'd want to be treated, right? Like always treat exactly. that person like a human and solve, and then it gives you the ability to, to solve the problem. Is that is that what I'm understanding? You are understanding that. And think about this. If there are other people in the room who observe you blowing up someone, yeah. how do you think they're going to act the next time you come in the room? Right. They're going to say, I, I'm, they're going to be on pins and needles because they're not sure how you're going to treat them when they make an error or when they mess up. So remaining relational in all situations. Perfect. Let's go to number two. Talk to us about yeah. number two, Chad. Yeah. So act like yourself. Um, so we all can look in the mirror and say, I know the best version of myself when I'm acting this way. Okay. And we probably all define that a little bit differently. But when we're acting like our true self, I would call it we're acting like our best self. And that's when we're in joy. We're in a state of joy. We're in a state of, of high relationship. We're in a state of recognizing the atmosphere around us is creating a wonderful um, environment that we want to be in. And by the, the dynamic of when you take the first one of remaining, or re remaining relational, then you begin building to that next acronym, which is by remaining relational, I'm then building a habit of acting like my true self, even when something difficult has come at me. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I was listening to one of my mentors, um, Ed Milet, uh, who's incredible. He was he was interviewing a gentleman on his show who talked about you create this avatar of like your ideal self, like the key mm -hmm. characteristics. And then mm -hmm. you create an avatar of kind of your worst self, like the person that shows up that you aren't really proud of and what those characteristics are. And, um, and then before you walk in a room, Ed called himself Superman. He said, Superman's here today. And so you start to think of those attributes and what that embodies, acting like your true self. I think, I agree, all of us have more potential than we can fathom to be Absolutely. good and to do good. And as we start to see that in ourselves, we start to act that way. You know, you shared briefly, and we probably don't have time to go deep into it, but just how the human brain works. Yes. It's just kind of a 30 second to 60 second snapshot of how that works and why maybe this principle of acting like yourself would tie into that. Yeah, well, so the dynamic is, is that the uh, right side of our brain fires at six times a second. The left side of our brain fires at five times a second. The right side is uh, kind of like um, our reaction. We're, we're, we're sensing everything around us. The left side is our logic and our thinking uh, side and our rational side. And then ultimately when our brain develops, we create neural connections between each side of our brain and those neural connections fire at 200 times a second. So when you develop a habit where you're not acting like yourself, you effectively are then firing that neural path that's going at 200 times a second. And so that's why when we're in situations that we just don't know how to handle, it is difficult to act like your true self because we default to whatever we've pre-wired into our brain from past behaviors. And so uh, rare leadership gives us the tools to first recognize Hey, I got to catch myself here first by remaining relational. And then I can begin to start rewiring my brain to act like my true self, to overcome those hardwiring connections that I've put into my brain over 30 plus years of bad behavior, frankly. Yeah, I've heard it said that it's like a, like ruts in a road, right? Mm -hmm. It gets difficult yep. 
the more you go down that path, the easier yep. it is to go down that path. You have to yep. break out of that. You can do it. It's it's, yeah. it's difficult, but you need help. And that's what this whole conference is about, right? Yep. This whole uh, event that you're putting on, Chad, is to help people step into being their true selves, get out of the ruts that are that are destructive, get out of the ruts yep. that are keeping them from reaching their potential and impacting the amount of people that they could be impacting and step into that true self. So let me give you a quick story, an example on this too. I mean, I just thought of this. So uh, another individual that I know who brought this book to my attention, his name's Dr. St. Cyr. And Dr. St. Cyr, I heard talk about this idea that um, our neural connections in our bodies, believe it or not, are one direction. So when our brain tells us to do something, when we launch into that activity or that behavior, it's going from our brain down the path, whether it's a physical action or whether it's an emotional reaction. So I recently had a situation here. One of my weaknesses, I'll admit it here on live camera, is that I, I, am, I can snap and become, I, I used to be a very angry person. You, you wouldn't guess it to know, to, to look at me, you wouldn't know it, but I was very angry inside at a lot of things. And I would snap at my children and act in ways that were highly uh, unlike myself, okay? So just about three weeks ago, I had a situation with my oldest daughter who uh, really triggered me, <laughs> and I started down the path of the old behaviors that I used to act in. And what's amazing is that I was two-thirds of the way through this uh, process, and I had this thought in the back of my mind of like, Oh no, I've started down this path and I can't stop myself. <laughs> and when and 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 I finished acting in a very angry, unrelational way with my oldest daughter. The the conversation finished. I went back to my bedroom and my wife came into the bedroom and she's like, Well, that didn't end well, did it? You know. <laughs> and she goes, What are you gonna do about it? And I said, Yeah, I know. I said, I, I'm gonna go to my daughter. But the other thing is, is I also realized, too, is that my other two children had witnessed all of this as well. And so I went to my daughter, I went to my son, and I went to my youngest daughter. And I apologized to all three of them. And I asked for forgiveness for all three of them. And I said, I recognize I was not acting like my true self. I was angry, and I lashed out, and I asked for forgiveness. And I said, I'm going to keep working on it. And they were all gracious and said, hey, Dad, we love you, and we we. We, we, we believe the best in you, obviously. So humbled myself, asked for Powerful. forgiveness, and I'm growing. So we've, Yeah, we've all had those experiences. Um, oh, yeah. I appreciate you sharing. That takes yeah. a lot of humility to do that. Thank you. All right, let's go to point number three, yep. return to joy. Teach us about that, Chad. Yeah, return to joy. So simply the fact how we all know people who wallow in the pit. I mean, they are constantly grumbling about everything. Well, guess what? They've wired their brains that way. They have built neural networks into their mind that everything that comes at them, they complain, gripe, blah, blah, blah. So um, taking the split second to just say, I am not going to let this get me down. OK, uh, I had a client here a couple weeks ago. We put together two solid loans. I was like, oh, this is great. We're going to refinance. You get into a great situation. This is going to be awesome. And the lady comes back five days later and says, nah, I don't want to move forward. We're just going to shut the whole thing down. And, and part of her decision was because another person had kind of stepped in and interfered with our uh, conversations. And I could just feel myself immediately just becoming irritated and um, emotionally uh, angry and withdrawn because of the fact that this other person inter interfered. And then I just had two transactions go down the tubes because of it. But as I was going through this feeling mentally and emotionally, I said, you know what? I'm not going to let this ruin my day. I'm not going to wallow in the pit and I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to dwell on this. Mm -hmm. I've got other stuff to do and there's other great opportunities out there. And so I'm going to move forward and I'm going to return to joy. I mean, that, that's really what it boils down to. I'm mentally saying yeah. return to joy, moving on. There's more opportunities out there. And as um, soon as you do that, as soon as you make that choice, you correct. open the space for good things to come in, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. we hold on to the stuff that happened. And if you held on to that much for much longer, you would right. have missed out on the great things that were just around the corner, right? You have to create the space yeah, for the good things to come right. in. 
Correct. You got it. And so, but this, here, here's the other cool thing too. And I think this point is a great point to bring up this whole concept of why this acronym works is that what I have found with our team is that we each have a, a little canvas on our desks with these four phrases that we're going through. And our team uses them. It's a common tribal language. And when we're dealing with hard things, mm -hmm. so we had a prime example where another, I had another time where I was griping in my office about something that went down on a loan. And one of my teammates hollered through the office and said, sounds like somebody needs to return to joy. <laughs> <laughs> and they called me out on the carpet. And the great part of it is, is everyone who heard that other team member yell that, it lightened the mood and it immediately changed the trajectory of what we were doing. And I let go of it and we moved on, you know. <laughs> Perfect segue into our final point, Chad. Take yeah. us home here, endure hardship well. Yes. So um, our culture does not know how to do hard things well. Plain and simple. You think about many of the people around you. When hard things come at them, they run away. They go the other direction. They don't want to lean into. I mean, you think about it. How often in our industry do you have to pick up the phone and make a hard phone call? Or you have to send an email that is really not going to be... Uh, the most positive message that somebody's going to want to hear. And our normal human tendency is we don't want to do those things because we don't want to feel the emotional weight that comes back at us. And so by training our brains how to say, I'm going to do a hard thing, we begin to endure it in a manner that is well. And by enduring it well, we then begin to model that to those around us and they go, wow, we, we, can, we can do hard things. We can figure out a way to get through this challenge. And the amazing thing of it is, is that the, these four um, components all connect well with each other because when I endure hardship well, that means that I'm remaining relational. It means that I'm acting like my true self. And I'm continually returning to joy when I'm facing hardship in doing it in a, in a manner that is well. So that's probably it in a nutshell. I love it, man. This has been uh, this has been really helpful, I think, for all of us to get a little bit of a snapshot. Now, imagine, imagine taking these principles. First and mm -hmm. foremost, let me let me start with this. Uh, at some point during this conversation, yeah, everybody listening to this, like me, has had has pictured in their mind breakdowns in their leadership, either in the home or in the workplace or in the mm -hmm. community. We've realized mm -hmm. like, boy, I could have been a lot bit better in those situations. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is the stuff that Chad shared is a great teaser, but this is not enough to rewire your brain, right? This, right. No. this 30 minute episode has not been enough to rewire your brain. You actually need to intentionally spend time getting the tools mm -hmm. needed in yep. order to start that process of rewiring. And so again, I want to extend the invitation to everybody once again, is it on October 25th yep. here in the Portland area, there's a free event that Chad is hosting called Rare Leadership. It goes into depth on these topics. Yep. If by chance you're tied up on Friday, there's another opportunity on Saturday. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. Yep. And um, they just need to go to rareleadership.net and find the events page and they'll find the info there. There you go. Rareleadership.net sign up for it there. Um, Chad, this has been amazing content. I'm super grateful for you. Um, yeah. I want to end with, with the signature question of the show. You're a big thinker. You've done some incredible things, um, mm -hmm. both in the, in the workplace, um, you know, um, amongst your team and your customers, both in your home and raising a great family and in the community. I know you're a leader in the community as yeah. well. What does a guy like you continue to do to be a big thinker, to continue to expand your own possibilities? Uh, teach us if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. You know, um, I think the number one thing for me in learning how to, I guess, think bigger is setting aside time to evaluate and uh, look at behaviors and actions and things that I'm doing and saying, okay, what are areas that I need to grow in emotional maturity? Uh, because if we don't stop and take the time, because I mean, honestly, if you think about it, a lot of what our culture does is our culture reacts. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, we as humans, when we stop and look in the mirror, most of the time we don't like what we see. That's the, that's the normal tendency. And the irony of it is, is that we have to stop and look in the mirror because that's the only way we're going to grow. And by learning how to stop and look in the mirror and go, all right, what's got to change? What's got to grow? What's got to modify? That's ultimately going to set you up for those opportunities where you can begin to say, okay, this is where I can begin to think bigger in whatever area of my life that I'm trying to make a difference in. I love that. Create this space for introspection. You got to. Uh, this yeah. event on the 25th is going to be um, a prime opportunity for people to do that. Anybody that wants to, again, improve their leadership, even if that's just improve the quantity of your sales. Again, mm -hmm. sales is leadership. You're leading your customers, um, yep. whether that be scaling a team, whether that be in a whether that be being a better parent or a better community leader, uh, this is going to be an amazing event. And I hope everybody takes it seriously and comes and joins us. So um, Chad, thank you again for all that you've contributed uh, to the audience today. I'm excited to be um, a part of this event. It's going to be fantastic. I'm gonna, uh, there's so many things I'm going to learn from it. Um, cool. And I also want to um, end with this charge to everybody that's listening today. Um, Chad has helped make this easier through what he shared today. But uh, my, my final request of all of us are three simple words, which are go think bigger. Thank you, Chad. I want to Thank yeah. you again for your time and uh, we will talk soon, my friend.